the realm. Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. What's up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another A Song of Ice and Fire video. Today I want to break down another one of my favorite chapters from the books. The main reason why I decided to do this chapter is because it was completely left out of the television show Game of Thrones. This is another scene I wish they would have included because Bran Stark is arguably one of the most important characters in the story, and one day he may even become the most powerful. Well, we get a glimpse of this at the very beginning of the story when he is visited by the Three-Eyed Crow when he's still in a coma. We never got the chance to see this on the TV show and that's unfortunate because what Bran is able to see during his coma is fascinating. He doesn't just see things that are happening presently, but he also gets a glimpse of the future. And, most importantly, the Three-Eyed Crow takes him beyond the wall to the heart of winter. Bran has no idea how important he actually is, but Blood Raven does this in an attempt to open up Bran's third eye so he can become a green seer. He needs to know that Westeros will soon face a threat that could potentially wipe out all of humanity. What's interesting is the Starks have been warning people about this threat the entire time, and they didn't even know it. I'll explain that later, but for now, let's take a look at what happens to Bran when he's in a coma, after he had been pushed from the window by Jaime Lannister. This is actually a very short chapter, much shorter than any of the other ones I've previously read on the channel, but that doesn't stop this chapter from being packed full of information. Hopefully, you will follow along with me as I read, then I will break down each thing Bran sees. Shall we begin? It seemed as though he had been falling for years. Fly, a voice whispered in the darkness, but Bran did not know how to fly, so all he could do was fall. Maester Lewin made a little boy of clay, baked him till he was hard and brittle, dressed him in Bran's clothes, and flung him off a roof. Bran remembered the way he shattered, but I never fall, he said falling. The ground was so far below him he could barely make it out through the gray mists that rolled around him, but he could feel how fast he was falling, and he knew what was waiting for him down there. Even in the dreams, you could not fall forever. He would wake up in the instant before he hit the ground, he knew. You always woke up in the instant before you hit the ground. And if you don't, the voice asked. The ground was closer now, still far, far away, a thousand miles away, but closer than it had been. It was cold here in the darkness. There was no sun, no stars, only the ground below coming up to smash him, and the gray mists, and the whispering voice. He wanted to cry. Not cry. Fly. I can't fly, Bran said. I can't. I can't. How do you know? Have you ever tried? The voice was high and thin. Bran looked around to see where it was coming from. A crow was spiraling down with him just out of reach, following him as he fell. Help me, he said. I'm trying, the crow replied. Say, got any corn? Bran reached into his pocket as the darkness spun dizzily around him. When he pulled his hand out, golden kernels slid from between his fingers into the air. They fell with him. The crow landed on his hand and began to eat. Are you really a crow? Bran asked. Are you really falling? The crow asked back. It's just a dream, Bran said. Is it? Asked the crow. I'll wake up when I hit the ground, Bran told the bird. You'll die when you hit the ground, the crow said. It went back to eating corn. Bran looked down. He could see the mountains now, their peaks white with snow, and the silver thread of rivers and dark woods. He closed his eyes and began to cry. That won't do you any good, the crow said. I told you, the answer is flying, not crying. How hard can it be? I'm doing it. The crow took to the air and flapped around Bran's hand. You have wings, Bran pointed out. Maybe you do too. Bran felt along his shoulders, groping for feathers. There are different kinds of wings, the crow said. Bran was staring at his arms, his legs. He was so skinny, just skin stretched taut over bones. Had he always been so thin? He tried to remember. A face swam up at him out of the gray mist, shining with light, golden. The things I do for love, it said. Bran screamed. The crow took to the air, calling. Not that, it shrieked at him. Forget that. You do not need it now. Put it aside. Put it away. It landed on Bran's shoulder and pecked at him, and the shining golden face was gone. Bran was falling faster than ever. The gray mists howled around him as he plunged toward the earth below. 
What are you doing to me? He asked the crow, tearful, teaching you how to fly. I can't fly. You're flying right now. I'm falling. Every flight begins with a fall, the crow said. Look down. I'm afraid. Look down. Bran looked down, and he felt his insides turn to water. The ground was rushing up at him now. The whole world was spread out below him, a tapestry of white and brown and green. He could see everything so clearly that for a moment he forgot to be afraid. He could see the whole realm and everyone in it. He saw Winterfell as the eagles see it, the tall towers looking squat and stubby from above, the castle walls just lines in the dirt. He saw Maester Lewin on his balcony, studying the sky through a polished bronze tube and frowning as he made notes in a book. He saw his brother Rob, taller and stronger than he remembered him, practicing swordplay in the yard with real steel in his hand. He saw Hodor, the simple giant from the stables, carrying an anvil to Mikan's forge, hefting it onto a shoulder as easily as another man might heft a bale of hay. At the heart of the godswood, the great white werewood brooded over its reflection in the black pool, its leaves rustling in a chill wind. When it felt Bran watching, it lifted its eyes from the still waters and stared back at him, knowingly. He looked east, and he saw a galley racing across the waters of the Bight. He saw his mother sitting alone in a cabin, looking at a bloodstained knife on a table in front of her, as the rowers pulled at their oars and Sir Roderick leaned across the rail, shaking and heaving. A storm was gathering ahead of them, a vast, dark roaring lashed by lightning, but somehow they could not see it. He looked south, and he saw the great blue-green rush of the trident. He saw his father pleading with the king, his face etched with grief. He saw Sansa crying herself to sleep at night, and he saw Arya watching in silence and holding her secrets hard in her heart. There were shadows all around them. One shadow was dark as ash, with the terrible face of a hound. Another was armored like the sun, golden and beautiful. Over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone, but when he opened his visor, there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. He lifted his eyes and saw clear across the narrow sea, to the free cities in the green Dothraki Sea and beyond, to vast Dothrak under its mountain, to the fabled lands of the Jade Sea, to a shy by the shadow, where dragons stirred beneath the sunrise. Finally, he looked north. He saw the wall shining like blue crystal, and his bastard brother John sleeping alone in a cold bed, his skin growing pale and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. And he looked past the wall, past endless forests cloaked in snow, past the frozen shore and the great blue-white rivers of ice and the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. North and north and north he looked, to the curtain of light at the end of the world, and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know, the crow whispered as if he sat on his shoulder. Now you know why you must live. Why, Bran said, not understanding, falling, falling, because winter is coming. Bran looked at the crow on his shoulder, and the crow looked back. It had three eyes, and the third eye was full of terrible knowledge. Bran looked down. There was nothing below him now but snow and cold and death, and a frozen wasteland where jagged blue-white spires of ice waited to embrace him. They flew up at him like spears. He saw the bones of a thousand other dreamers impaled upon their points. He was desperately afraid. Can a man still be brave if he's afraid? He heard his own voice saying, small and far away, and his father's voice replied to him, that is the only time a man can be brave. Now, Bran, the crow urged, choose, fly or die. Death reached for him, screaming. Bran spread his arms and flew. Wings unseen drank the wind and filled and pulled him upward. The terrible needles of ice receded below him. The sky opened up. Bran soared. It was better than climbing. It was better than anything. The world grew small beneath him. I'm flying, he cried out in delight. I've noticed, said the three-eyed crow. It took to the air, flapping its wings in his face, slowing him, blinding him. He faltered in the air as its pinions beat against his cheeks. Its beak stabbed at him fiercely and Bran felt a sudden blinding pain in the middle of his forehead, between his eyes. What are you doing, he shrieked. The crow opened its beak and called at him, a shrill scream of fear, and the gray mists shuddered and swirled around him and ripped away like a veil, and he saw that the crow was really a woman, a serving woman with long black hair, and he knew her from somewhere, from Winterfell, yes, that was it. He remembered her now, 
and then he realized that he was in Winterfell, in a bed high in some chilly tower room, and the black-haired woman dropped the basin of water to shatter on the floor and ran down the steps, shouting, He's awake! He's awake! He's awake! Bran touched his forehead between his eyes. The place where the crow had pecked him was still burning, but there was nothing there. No blood. No wound. He felt weak and dizzy. He tried to get out of bed, but nothing happened. And then there was movement beside the bed, and something landed lightly on his legs. He felt nothing. A pair of yellow eyes looked into his own, shining like the sun. The window was open and it was cold in the room, but the warmth that came off the wolf enfolded him like a hot bath. His pup, Bran realized. Or was it? He was so big now. He reached out to pet him, his hand trembling like a leaf. When his brother Rob burst into the room, breathless from his dash up the tower steps, the dire wolf was licking Bran's face. Bran looked up calmly. His name is Summer, he said. Alright, now let's talk about what happens during the chapter. As you can see, the Three-Eyed Crow wasn't just trying to wake Bran up, but he was also trying to open Bran's third eye. It isn't enough for Bran to only survive. He needs to become a Green Seer. The Three-Eyed Crow was telling Bran, you must choose. You either fly or die, but that's not as cut and dry as it may seem. At this point, we all know the White Walkers are coming, and it seems like they are a major threat to everyone's existence. If everything Bran has been told is true, then he would be one of the biggest factors in defeating the White Walkers. In order for Bran to do this, he has to become a Green Seer, and if he doesn't become a Green Seer, not only would he die, but so would everyone else. Bran might not actually know this, but he has the weight of the entire realm resting on his shoulders. Bran could have been selfish and said, you know what, I don't want to take this dangerous journey out beyond the wall to find some three-eyed crow in a cave. He could have said that if he wanted to, but instead he chose to fly, and what he sees will forever change him. What I really like about this so much is the fact that it's happening so early in the very first book. Depending on which copy you have, Bran is able to see these things before we're even 200 pages into the story. The first thing Bran sees that has an impact on him is related to his injury. This is a very important moment in Bran's life because it led to him taking this path. He wanted to become a knight, but once he lost the use of his legs, he needed to find another purpose, and that's exactly what the Three-Eyed Crow intended on providing for him. Ever since Bran was pushed from the tower, he has struggled to remember who actually pushed him. The fact that he's in a coma should tell you he did sustain a significant head injury during this fall, so the memory of what happened that day is a little cloudy. However, Bran does get a glimpse of Jaime Lannister because it says, He tried to remember. A face swam up at him out of the gray mist, shining with light, golden. The things I do for love, it said. This causes Bran to scream because what little memory he does have still terrifies him. We all know that was when he was pushed because we remember what Jamie said right beforehand. And we all know he can be associated with the word golden. Not only is his hair golden, but his Kingsguard armor is golden. And later on, when he loses his hand, it becomes golden too. Now, the reason why I wanted to point this out is because of what the crow said next. When Bran started to scream, the crow took to the air, calling. Not that, it shrieked at him. Forget that. You do not need it now. Put it aside. Put it away. I believe the crow is letting us know Bran and Jamie will meet again. He told Bran, you don't need to worry about that now. He did not tell him to forget about it forever. He simply said, just put it aside, because I have more important things to show you first. You don't need it now, but you will need it later. That's what I'm thinking he's trying to say. I think most of us knew Bran and Jamie had to meet again at some point, but I think Bran will actually need him in the future. Jamie Lannister may play a big part in the endgame, and this is something Bran may come to find out later. But let's move on for now. Next, Bran starts to learn how to fly, and he's able to see everything. The whole world was spread out below him, a tapestry of white and brown and green. He could see everything so clearly that for a moment, he forgot to be afraid. He could see the whole realm and everyone in it. What Brain starts to see after this is all basically happening in the present day. First, he flies above his home, Winterfell, and he sees your typical day-to-day -day activities. Maester Lewin was looking at the sky and making notes in his book, Rob was practicing with his sword in the yard, and Hodor was carrying an anvil to Mikan's forge. This isn't very interesting stuff. Bran would be able to see all of this once he wakes up and looks out his window. But then, he's able to see things far and away. When Bran looks east, 
he can see a galley racing across the waters of the bight. He saw his mother sitting alone in a cabin, looking at a bloodstained knife on a table in front of her. As the rowers pulled at oars and Sir Roderick leaned across a rail, shaking and heaving, a storm was gathering ahead of them, a vast, dark roaring lashed by lightning, but somehow they could not see it. This is shortly after the assassin tried to kill Bran. The bloodstained knife Catelyn is looking at is the cat's ball dagger. As Bran is looking at this, he doesn't even realize his life was in danger a second time because he's still in a coma when the assassin came to his room. Even though this is never said, Bran is probably wondering why his mom is holding that knife. She is currently on her way to see Ned to inform him about the second attempt on Bran's life. The interesting thing about this passage is the ominous storm that Bran is able to see. This is foreshadowing the trouble that lies ahead for his mother. Catelyn cannot see the storm because it's a metaphor. There's not an actual storm in the sky above them, but Catelyn has embarked on a journey that will lead to her death. She will never see Bran again, unless she sees him as Lady Stoneheart. Bran also saw his father pleading with the king, his face etched with grief. He saw Sansa crying herself to sleep at night, and he saw Arya watching in silence and holding her secrets hard in her heart. This is when the rest of Bran's family is traveling down to King's Landing. Ned is pleading with the king because he's trying to stop Sansa's direwolf lady from being killed. This is why Bran is able to see Sansa crying herself to sleep at night because of what happened. Arya is watching in silence, holding her secrets hard in her heart. She will never forget what Joffrey and even Cersei had done. This ultimately leads to Arya putting their names on her list. That moment accelerates Arya's character into a much darker direction. This doesn't completely shatter Sansa's hope of becoming Joffrey's queen, but the glass does start to crack and become a spider web, a web she will be trapped in for quite some time. Bran also notices there are shadows all around them. One shadow was dark as ash, with the terrible face of a hound, another armored like the sun, golden and beautiful. Over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone, but when he opened his visor, there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. There are many different ways you can interpret this, but I think the first shadow is obviously the Hound. He's dark as ash, and ash can be in relation to being burned, and he has a terrible face of a Hound. If you read the books, you will see the Hound's face is quite often referred to as looking terrible and burnt. The second shadow sounds a lot like Jamie Lannister. It says he was armored like the sun, golden and beautiful. Jamie is often described as being beautiful and golden. We also know Jamie and the Hound arrived at Winterfell together, so it would make sense for them to still be together as they head back down the King's Road to King's Landing. It's the last shadow that piques my interest the most. This one sounds like Gregor Clegane, but the way he is described sounds like Bran is glimpsing the future. It says, Over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone, but when he opened his visor, there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. As you can see, he is first described as a giant in armor made of stone. Gregor Clegane is a giant, and his armor being made of stone is a reference to him being the mountain, because mountains are made of stone too. But when he opens his visor, there's nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. This sounds a lot like the Mountain 2.0. But that doesn't happen until he fights Oberyn Martell, which is much later in the story. This would have to mean Bran is either seeing the future, or this is just foreshadowing what will eventually happen to Gregor Clegane. Later in the books, Kyburn and Maester Pycelle both make comments about his veins turning black because of the poison in his blood. In the books, it's also rumored that Gregor Clegane no longer has a head, so maybe this is why there is nothing behind the man's visor but darkness and thick black blood. The Black Blood could also be a reference to him being reanimated. There are other characters that have been brought back from the dead, and their blood always seems to be black after this happens. Melisandre's blood is black as well, which makes me think Melisandre was also resurrected by R'hllor, but I already made a video about that. Anyways, the shadows Bran sees all around his family sound like the Hound, Jaime Lannister, and the Mountain. That's the way I always saw it, but if you think it's someone else, feel free to leave your thoughts down below. What Bran sees next is pretty interesting. It says, He lifted his eyes and saw clear across the narrow sea, to the free cities and the green Dothraki Sea and beyond, to vast Dothrak under its mountain, to the fabled lands of the Jade Sea, to a shy by the shadow, 
where dragons stirred beneath the sunrise. Everything Bran is being shown seems to be in the present day or near future. This always made me wonder if there could be more dragons in the realm. We know Illyrio gave Danny the dragon eggs, and he told her they were from a shy. But when Bran is looking at a shy and seeing dragons star beneath the sunrise, Danny already has her dragon eggs with her. So what is Bran actually looking at? Could this just be a reference to Danny's dragons, or is he seeing something else? Danny was given her eggs during her wedding. That was a few chapters before this one, so I'm thinking there could be more dragons or more dragon eggs in a shy. I think if Bran was looking at Danny's dragons, it should say they were stirring in Pentos, where the eggs are currently at. But this makes it sound like something else is waking up in a shy by the shadow. But that's just my opinion. Let's move on to the next one. It says, Finally he looked north. He saw the wall shining like blue crystal, and his bastard brother John sleeping alone in a cold bed. His skin growing pale and hard, as the memory of warmth fled from him. At first glance, this might not seem like anything noteworthy, but some people believe this could be an image of John after he was stabbed by his Brothers of the Night's Watch. It says John is sleeping alone, which is kind of weird because John always sleeps with ghosts. It does say his skin is growing pale and hard, almost like a dead person's body would grow stiff, but you have to remember John is in the far north where it's extremely cold. I'm not sure if I want to believe Bran is looking at John as he's about to die, but I would like to believe Bran is being shown all these things for a reason. There should be some significance to each one. But I want to move on to the last sighting. I think this one shows why the Starks originally chose their house words, Winter is coming. The last one says he looked past the wall, past the endless forest cloaked in snow, past the frozen shore and the great blue-white rivers of ice, and the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. North and north and north he looked, to the curtain of light at the end of the world, and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know, the crow whispered as it sat on his shoulder. Now you know why you must live. Why, Bran said, not understanding, falling, falling. Because winter is coming. Bran looked at the crow on his shoulder and the crow looked back. It had three eyes and the third eye was full of a terrible knowledge. Bran looked down. There was nothing below him now but snow and cold and death. A frozen wasteland where jagged blue-white spires of ice waited to embrace him. They flew up at him like spears. He saw the bones of a thousand other dreamers impaled upon their points. He was desperately afraid. That is the main reason why I have always said the Stark words meant something much deeper than just winter is coming. The Starks have forgotten the true meaning of this phrase over time, but the Three-Eyed Crow is showing Bran what it truly means. That's why he says those words when Bran is looking into the heart of winter, where the others reside. That's why Bran must live. This is why he must fly. What Bran had seen terrified him, causing him to cry out in fear. You see, the Starks have a deep-rooted history with the others, and I think that was either forgotten over time, or it was kept a secret over time. But Bran Stark will start to unravel this mystery as he begins to train with Bloodraven in his cave. Winter is Coming is not just a reminder that summer is coming to an end. The founders of how Stark would say this as a warning because life as they knew it could possibly be coming to an end. But that was forgotten. In fact, in the present day, most of the characters don't even believe the White Walkers were ever real. But as Bran Stark looks down into the heart of winter, he can see a thousand other green seers impaled upon these magical ice spears that were created by the others. But Bran is quickly learning that he may be the one true green seer that can save the entire realm. All he needs to do is fly. 